off-rolling in Overwatch. It's often a pretty touchy subject. We all do it from time to time, and sometimes it goes better than expected. And sometimes, well, let's be honest, oftentimes, we throw. The point is, it's something you're gonna experience no matter what, and this even translates into professional play. Which gets us into today's topic. Times where players used out-of-position heroes in the Overwatch League. For those of you who maybe got into the league post rollock you may not have ever gotten to witness a lot of the most unusual composition and bizarre hero selections of all time. It happens today from time to time, but when you look at the league's history as a whole, there's a ridiculous number of examples. And with this off-rolling comes various levels of success. With how out of context some of them can feel, I thought we could look back at some of the most prominent examples. This won't be every single instance ever, more so just just the ones that really pop out at you or give you a good laugh. We've got a lot to cover and react to, so let the clown fiesta begin. And I couldn't possibly think of a better example to start off with than Ryu J. Hong becoming a main tank in 2018. God, what a wacky time to be a Soul fan, huh? I'm sure every Soul fan watching this video is cringing with pain with this one, but let's be honest, this one had to be here. Benching two main tank players in favor of your support player is one of the most bizarre coaching blunders we have ever seen. Jae Hong would go on to play Winston, Ryan, and Arisa for the Seoul Dynasty for a few short weeks. And surprise surprise, the results were mostly lackluster. He just wasn't good enough at the hero due to his lack of experience, nor was he supposed to be. But funny enough, Seoul were somewhat competitive, even taking the London Spitfire and the LA Valiant to map 5s and 4 rowing the Houston Outlaws. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but it happened. But did you also know, along with Monkey, Jae Hong played Sombra and Junkrat? Yeah. He played a bunch of different stuff. The Sombra thing was pretty typical at the time. Lots of flex support players would roll out with this composition, and it was pretty typical to see it happen either on defense or on attack on like Horizon Lunar Kani, for example. And sometimes it worked pretty well for Soul. The crazier thing to me, though, is when he broke out Junkrat. Now that is some random stuff. On Horizon, on attack, this man broke out Junkrat and actually managed to get a good rip tire kill, so good for him. While the main tank stuff was a disaster, and honestly an embarrassment and blemish on his career, at least he found some success off-rolling in a different path. But Jae Hong ain't the only player in 2018 to swap over to main tank without warning. We've got to move into the Dallas Fuel, who have multiple role swaps at this one position in one year. The most obvious, and meme-worthy of course, is Taimu. When XQC served his suspension and Coco refused to play, Taimu stepped in to play the Winston role. It made some sense seeing he was the team leader and all, just like Jae Hong, but it really did destroy his mental and confidence, and he just didn't stand any sort of real chance due to that lack of experience. In fact, there was a time where he was asking for advice from pro players, including Fissure on his stream. That's how bad things would get. Dallas sucked, and so did Taimu, but to no fault of his own, of course. And eventually, when he burned out and decided to stop playing for a bit, and XQC inevitably got kicked off the team, Dallas would put Mickey on the main tank role. While the results were slightly better, obviously Mickey isn't experienced on Monkey either. If you include OG who became the main tank in Stage 3, the Dallas Fuel utilized five different players at this one position. Talk about weird. But as a little saving grace for Mickey, he did famously pick up Day 1 Brigitte swapping over to a hybrid like tank slash support role during Stage 4 that same year, and he absolutely owned on her. Him and Dallas were some of the early pioneers of centering compositions around this absolutely busted hero. Mickey felt like an unkillable god. His skills weren't anything out of this world, but many teams had a nightmare dealing with him, as he really did deny a lot of space on that hero and made dive practically impossible. You can largely thank Mickey for showing teams that playing this type of composition was pretty much useless the rest of that year a good redemption arc for an otherwise rough season. To make things even more bizarre in Dallas that same year, the coaching did go on to ask Seagull to switch from DPS to, you know, have Rascal replace him, and then move over to D.Va. If there's any solace, Seagull was actually pretty good at D.Va. His numbers were off the charts, and Dallas, even when they were losing, you could still feel his impact. 
He honestly was an upgrade over Mickey when it came to D.Va, and immediately you felt it as the man helped push the prime NYXL to a map 5 in stage freaking 2 when that team was a disaster still. And you know what's crazy about it all? This was only his second time playing D.Va in an actual game. That's ridiculous, man. And as Dallas improved and that stage 4 happened where they made stage playoffs, Siegel began to shine more and more as he'd pivot between that flex DPS role and D.Va on a regular basis. And by the end of stage 4, Siegel was quite obviously one of the best D.Va players in the league. It goes to show that Siegel truly was a superstar and he could pick up pretty much anything he put his mind to. Speaking of successful off-rolling, how could we not talk about Takei and his magical Zarya in the 2020 playoffs? Some people may not think of this as a true swap, since he played Zarya and Goats as well beforehand, but it had been a solid year since Goats had died, so I personally count it. He channeled all of his focus into DPS for a whole year, but then he went back onto Zarya and the muscle memory was still there. And it was obvious he was the focal point of the game plan with how many resources he got. His Zarya was dominating in ways we've never seen before. It was a true pocket Zarya. It's honestly impressive how much he carried a team that was otherwise mediocre that year to a top 3 finish in North America. Decay Zarya was amazing. But did you also know that he played Roadhog and D.Va as well? The D.Va thing was mostly to stall on point, I believe, but the man straight up became an off-tank player as a DPS. It's amazing how much he could do on a different role. Now, Decay might have been goaded with his role swaps, but his rival Bumper was a chad. His carefree attitude didn't just translate into tank play. Bumper played random DPS heroes when Vancouver would break out those multi-DPS comps. Between Bumper trying to have fun out there, and Vancouver loving to flex on their opponents, they let Bumper have the keys. Bumper famously played Hanzo numerous times throughout the year with mixed results. Sometimes he'd look alright and hit some good shots, other times you wouldn't really feel his presence. But did you also know that he played Fara against the Hongzhou Spark in Stage 2? It failed miserably and all, but it was still really fun to watch. And what about the time he played Widowmaker and Tracer against the Chengdu Hunters on Nepal? You gotta have some serious cojones to try and match Chengdu with weirdness. And again, he really didn't contribute much during these times, but just watching a tank player break out DPS was interesting to say the least. Alright, but if we're gonna talk about bumper off rolling, of course we've gotta talk about his rival Super. Super might have the most famous roll swap of all when he utilized the Genji for the shock, and this, keep in mind, is way after Rollock had already been implemented. This wasn't some random multi-DPS composition. This was the shock genuinely flexing on everyone around them by having their main tank player seriously try and play Genji. I get they were both kind of terrible at the time, but to flex on your opponents so hard that you would play super on Genji is some unreal levels of disrespect. Obviously, they were just having fun out there, and they could get away with it because they're that much better than their opponents, but to play super for an entire series against Boston, and at least part of one against Houston, is wild stuff. I mean, seriously. Okay, super on Genji, that one most of us know, but... I'm sure only the hardcore fans out there will know that he also played some Zenyatta back in 2018. Yeah, you heard me right. He played some Zenyatta, specifically on Junkertown, when the Shock would roll out with a triple tank composition, they'd keep Sleepy on the bench, which would leave a hole at flex support, so when they'd arrive at around point C, you'd see Super sometimes swap over to Zen. And this happened against Dallas, and it actually kind of worked, believe it or not. And then the other time, he played against the NYXL. Yeah, Super played Zenyatta against Jonek. Probably went about as you'd expect. Speaking of Zen play, we have a more recent example from 2022, when Backbone, or excuse me, his other persona when he played the role, Boneback played the Zen for the London Spitfire when Ana Zen was a really popular composition. And genuinely, he looked really good on Zen. I'm not gonna sit here and say he was one of the best in the league or anything, but he held the zone. He had some pretty nasty shots, he fragged out from time to time, it worked. This was a legitimate comp that the London Spitfire could run, and there were moments in time where he'd swap between DPS and Zen in the same match, which is really impressive stuff, especially in a roll lock when you're not free to swap whenever you want. This was a map-by-map -map thing, and he could still hold his own and stay consistent. But unfortunately for Backbone, he's got absolutely nothing on our boy Mirror. 
This man takes role swapping in the same match to the same level. Yeah, we have what he did this year where he went from DPS to tank playing things like Junker Queen, Doomfist, and Aressa and whatnot, but beforehand he was already well known as a flex god. In 2020 on the LA Gladiators, he became the first and only player in Overwatch League history in the Rolock era to play all three roles in the same match. In a summer matchup against the Toronto Defiant in 2020, Deepay decided to get a little crazy with this strategy. He went from playing Junkrat on Lijong Tower, to Zarya on Watchpoint Gibraltar, to Zen and Brig on Temple of Anubis, all in the same game on a map-to-map -map basis. It's difficult enough to survive and succeed in this league on the role you're used to, let alone the ones that you're not. Now, in all fairness to Mir, he's played just about everything in the game previously. He played Zarya and Goats, he's played Brigitte and all of that stuff, but to do it all just that fast in one instance is some really impressive stuff, and he deserves a lot of credit for standing up and being that guy for the Glads. How about a couple of other examples of DPS players swapping onto a different role and finding success? One that immediately comes to mind for me is Architect on Ana for the San Francisco Shock in the beginning of 2020. It seemed really weird at the time, and a lot of people were questioning as to why the heck this would happen. Even if Violet isn't that great of an Ana player, it seemed weird to have Architect in there, but he immediately made all of our mouths just go wide open with how well he was playing on this role that he's not all that familiar with. We had seen him play Brig during the GOATS era, but it's a bit different to swap on to Ana with positioning, making clutch plays with your cooldowns, but he managed to do all of it extremely well, and he helped enable his teammates to do some great things and a big win against the Dallas Fuel on the road. But of course, he also had an instance where he didn't look all that good on Ana. Coming last year during Season 5, a lot of you are likely familiar with it if you keep up with APAC, but there was a moment or two on the Hongzhou Spark where he picked up the Ana, and at that point, he was already kind of washed, his career was basically done, the Spark were struggling, so he didn't look nearly as good as that time on the San Francisco Shock. But nonetheless, there have been multiple instances throughout his career, aside from the GOATS era, where Architect picked up the flex support role. But Architect ain't the only guy to find success on the support roles of DPS, because we also have Profit. A lot of us will look towards what happened in 2022. He fully swapped onto the Brigitte slash main support role, if you will, during the summer showdown when double main support was a thing. The team thought it'd be better to play a more experienced veteran on Brig rather than creative. And the results speak for itself. Profit played relatively well on Brig, and Soul made it to the summer showdown finals. Was Prophet the best Brig in the league? No, but you could see his aggression and his bloodthirstiness firsthand. It led to that Inspire passive staying up for a relatively high rate, and he did a pretty good job. I wasn't expecting him to be amazing. It had been years since he picked up the hero, but he got the job done. And yes, I do mean it's been years, because for those of you who weren't around, in 2018, when Brig first came out, Prophet also played her back then, and he was genuinely one of the best Briggs in the league at the time. It was a pretty short sample size, it was only for like a stage, and then of course a couple of playoff games, but Prophet did really well on her, and was probably the second best Brig only behind Mickey. And last but not least for DPS players who swapped over to support, we have Jake who yes, did have some Brigitte experience during the GOATS era, but as we all know, that was mostly just a DPS player having to do what he had to do. This was more so a full-on swap, from the flex DPS that he had been throughout his entire career to main support, where we'd see him pick up things like Brig, Bap, and even Mercy, and that, my friends, was really cursed. Jake on Mercy is something that never should have existed. It felt so, 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 so weird. The Brig thing, it made sense. We've seen him play it before, but when he played Mercy, I was just in a world of confusion, and it just all felt so, so cursed. Okay, but what about the moments where we reverse the role? What happens when we go from support to DPS? Well, we have a couple of examples. One that immediately comes to mind for anyone who watched recently is Shu going over to play some DPS for the LA Gladiators. It was for a short amount of time, but there were a couple of maps where he played the Sojourn. He looked alright, but it was more so a weird situation. Patty Pan wasn't playing anymore, they needed some sort of Sojourn, but they refused to play Ans on her for whatever reason, so until they got happy, 
Shu got his name called in that regard. The Glide struggled, and he didn't look amazing either, but it was still pretty cool to see him get some picks from time to time, as it had been the first time we'd seen him play any sort of DPS since 2019 during those random Widow Swap days. Another good example of a support player fully committing to DPS is Kareev. For those of you who know his history, you'd know that back in the day, when he first started playing professionally, he was a DPS player, but then he swapped over to flex support for a while, and that seemed like his calling, until Coach Moon, current coach of the Shanghai Dragons, forced Kareev to swap back onto the DPS role during Stage 2 when he was completely hating on agilities. Our boy Kareev went from being a Zen sensation and a guy who would flex onto Mercy, to fully playing what he used to be known for, like Widowmaker and Cassidy. He even played some far runs in Genji. Kareev did a lot of everything back then for a very brief amount of time. I don't even think it was a full 10 games, but it was a disaster. Not his fault. He did have some moments where he looked good, but the Valiant sucked during that time, and just having him on that roll kind of forced everything out of whack. The cool thing is, though, Kareev also found some other success swapping onto DPS in a more natural situation that was planned. A lot of the time, the LA Valiant would sometimes run a composition on point A of Horizon Lunar Colony, where they'd play three DPS and have Kareev opting to go off of the Zenyatta and onto Widowmaker, and a lot of the time he would find some good picks out of spawn, even killing big names like Shurfor in the process. Other instances of Kareev off-rolling include playing Zarya during the 2019 GOATS era, when he was temporarily on DPS yet again, as well as playing some Roadhog during the playoffs and Junkertown, and even a little bit of Tracer. Another solid example of a flex support going on to different roles and still looking somewhat okay would be Violet, who we all know did the main support swap from flex support in 2022 and still looked pretty darn good as one of the better support players in the league. But the example that's a bit more interesting and out of left field is when the Shock would utilize him on DPS in 2021. It only happened a few times, but it was a legitimate strategy this team liked to use, and it found a mild level of success. Violet playing things like Cassidy, for example, went well for him. I know that firsthand when they broke out Violet on DPS for the first time against the Glads, I was scratching my head in confusion, but quickly became a fan of it when he ended up hitting some big shots and getting some pivotal picks. It's stuff like this that shows that Violet is just really good at Overwatch in general. To swap onto multiple roles without too much of an issue is proof alone that with enough prep time, he can do just about anything that you need him to to succeed. But not everybody is going to succeed, and not everybody's going to have enough time to truly prepare. And the best possible example that I could ever think of in this regard would be when the Florida Mayhem put Checkmate on main tank in 2021. OG suffering from some burnout, so he's got to step away for a bit. And the solution, because the Florida Mayhem have no other players available, is to put their flex DPS player, their rookie flex DPS, on main tank and have him fend for himself against some absolute legends of the game like Fearless. What do you think is going to happen in that scenario? Of course your team's going to suck when you have him play things like Orisa and Rhine. He has no idea what the heck he's doing. It's not his fault, but that's just the brutal truth. But funny enough, who here remembers when the mayhem with Checkmate on main tank took the Dallas Fuel to five maps? That was some crazy stuff, man. Even though it wasn't going to win them some games, the way this guy was playing Ryan was inspirational to just about every plat player in existence. The random charges, charging through teleporter to try and catch the opponent off guard. This man was doing everything in his power with some set plays to help his team win, even though they're at a real disadvantage. Checkmate's the real MVP, man. And the fact that he's persevered through all of this and is still out of career is real evidence of just how amazing he actually is. Another all-time classic flop is definitely when the LA Valiant in 2019, at the start of the GOATS era, had Kuki switch from being their backup main tank to their starting main support player. As a former Valiant fan, this one to this day still fills my heart with rage, because there's a good chance the Valiant maybe wouldn't have gone 0-7 that stage if they had just played Custa full-time, but apparently, in the words of Coach Moon, the reason Kuki was playing main support instead of Custa was because Custa was too smart for the rest of the team. Team. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. But regardless, poor Kuki had to go in there and be fed to the wolves with his little to no experience on the roll. 
and generally just looking lost out there, dying to random diva bombs, having poor beat timings. It just all was out of whack, and it's not fair to him, but he sucked. No other way around it. But funny enough, Kuki is not the only person to temporarily go from main tank to main support on this list, as Mono, one of the greatest main tanks in the history of the game, also played main support. It was just for one game, when Ark was out with an illness, but nonetheless, this is something that happened. Mono played main support for the NYXL in Stage 2 against their rivals, the London Spitfire. And I think the most mind-blowing thing of all is Mono didn't do that bad. I was expecting a lot worse from him. He played some Mercy, and he played Lucio, and the Lucio in particular, he had some good moments on it. Some clutch beats to keep his team in the game, he did everything he possibly could with little experience on the roll, so my hat goes off to him. It's respectable when you really think about it, as the NYXL lost in a 5-map effort to that Spitfire team. And keep in mind, New York had just previously lost to them in the Stage 1 playoffs when the NYXL were at full strength back then. And now, they're without their starting main support, they're having their starting main tank on a different roll, and they still almost win. That's how well Mono was able to do in a pinch, and he deserves a lot of credit for it. Another great example that comes to mind of a tank player swapping onto something different and holding his own is definitely Gator in the 2019 playoffs. Technically, he was still on tank, but not the one that he was accustomed to. As usually, he's known for his Reinhardt, Orisa, and Winston, but instead, the team opted him to play on Sigma over Fried Wiener. And the result was pretty spectacular. The Atlanta Reign didn't win the finals or anything that year, but they were competitive throughout, and Gator honestly looked like one of the best Sigma players in the league. Some people argue he was the best Sigma in the playoffs, and for good reason. He was honestly balling out there with some big-time accretions and with his huge fluxes. Gator did a lot for a guy who really isn't used to the off-tank role at all. And the cherry on top of this performance is how he clearly diffs Choi Yo Open in a Sigma battle. You know, the guy who would go on to win 2019 Grand Finals MVP and is arguably the greatest off-tank player to touch the game? Yeah. Gator beat him in a Sigma duel and is arguably the thing that lit a fire under him and helped him improve ultimately on the hero. And with that said, that's gonna do it, ladies and gentlemen. Those are numerous instances, not all, but a bunch of times where players off-rolled at the Overwatch League level with various levels of success. Let me know what you think about all of this down in the comments below. Let me know about any instances that I might have missed, and tell me your favorite one as well. I'd love to hear it. And until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.